All right, so I want to begin with a land acknowledgement and I recognize that many of you might be joining from other places. So I'd encourage you to put your location up in the chat if you'd like. Um, but I'm joining from BU Cares and BU Cares is located on Treaty 2 territory. This is traditional shared land between the Dakota and the Ojibwe. The Turtle Mountains and Brandon area was and still is home to the Métis peoples and we acknowledge and respect the history and the land and the treaties of this area and the peoples of this area, including the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, the Anishinaabe, the Dene and the Métis peoples. And so with that, I would like to now introduce to you our speaker for this evening, Dr. Aloysia Senichi. And I'll just uh, give you a little bit of background. So Dr. Anichi is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Psychology and Student Services here at BU. Uh, he's fairly recent to BU and so he's a new colleague of mine and I'm privileged to have had a, a few wonderful conversations with him about his research. I always come away enlightened and um, inspired. Uh, Dr. Alicia, Alo Oh, I'm so sorry. Dr. Aloysius Anichi received his PhD in Human Development, Learning and Culture from the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology and Special Education at UBC in Vancouver. His research focuses on the intersections of culture and learning processes, so things like engagement, motivation, self-regulation of learning, and he developed a framework for culturally responsive self-regulated learning that integrates culturally responsive teaching with self-regulated learning practices. And so he's now doing some funded research looking at pre-service teachers as learning processes and culturally responsive teaching, self-efficacy. So I don't want to take up too much of his time. There's many more wonderful things I could say about Dr. Anichi. Um, but I, I'll just turn it over to him. And I know it's awkward on Zoom, but I'd like us to be able to give him a warm round of applause. So you can use the emoji at the bottom of your screen or unmute yourself and join me in giving him a round of applause. Welcome and take it away. Thank you, Dr. Lerm, for this generous introduction and the invitation to be part of this uh, lecture series. And I thank all of you who are joining from different parts of the globe. I can see from the names, uh, some people are outside of this country. I can see some names uh, from Nigeria. I know it's uh, over midnight at this point uh, for people joining from Nigeria. So thank you so much everybody for coming in to be part of this conversation. And talking about Nigeria, I remember with nostalgia growing up from the Southern part of the country and I lived with my grandfather and parents at the time. My grandfather was a retired head teacher and he will always use proverbs and idioms when he ever converses with me. And we'll take time to explain some of the meanings of these, especially how they emerge from our cultural context to me. And my parents being classroom teachers, as you can imagine our home became extension of school. And there is time for everything, just like the scripture would say. And so when we come back from school, there are specific things to do at a specific time without excluding the evening studies. And so during the evening period, they will be preparing for their classes. Uh, my siblings and myself will sit together working on our home assignments. And I remember how my sister would teach me mathematics, especially calculation and subtractions using pebble, sticks, uh, or that seed that is African star apple. And so it was later in my life I started seeing how the conversations I was having with my grandfather, my parents, my siblings, and indeed everybody I came in contact in the village were shaping the way I think, the way I see reality, and even the way I make decisions about my behaviors. This understanding came to forefront um, during my experiences working outside Africa, in Europe and North America. Something that came to be permanent is how our social or cultural context shape the way we think, the way we express our thoughts and the way we behave. These are some of the wide experiences I brought to Canada for my doctoral program. And so I was excited to be in this country to learn. And when I came to the first day of my class, just like every other person, it's a memorable day for me. 
I was enthusiastic to learn to come into the class. And when I came into the class, I met a new environment, different from what I'm used to with regards to learning. And even before the class, it was a bit difficult to navigate the readings assigned for that particular day because some of them were not talking about things I'm familiar with. And so when we came into the class, at some point, the conversation was so fast that it was difficult for me to catch up with. And you see, during the break, I approached the guy and said to him, I really would want to see the possibility of discussing some of these readings before we come into the class. And he turned down my request. And after the class, I was driving home. I was questioning myself, am I really in the right place? Am I in the wrong place? Things were not the same, but I said to myself, I will not give up. I have to struggle, I have to continue. This experience of mine is not different from experiences of many students, international students, students from minority or underrepresented groups. And so because of this, I made a decision to commit to finding out ways to support students from diverse cultures, especially when there are many of them studying in the same classroom context. And that is my interest. And that is why I want to share with you some thoughts today about how best we can support these students. And so the idea is to support culturally diverse students in terms of motivation and engagement in their classroom context. And one thing that is obvious is that we all have cultures and we see things and realities through the lens of our culture. And so when culturally diverse students and indeed everybody come together, they come with these ideas, their knowledge, their experiences, their inspirations and their aspirations. And so in multicultural classroom context, we can think about possible benefits. Some of the benefits include that there is increasing credibility. People consider multiple new ideas. There is opportunities to come up with new innovations to solve problems. And beyond that, there are opportunities to share diverse and different perspectives to things. I remember in one of the classes I took in motivation. So one day we were discussing about extrinsic motivation, which is about people getting to doing something because of external factors or causes. And so most of the conversations was around why and how bad extrinsic motivation is. And then I thought to myself, in my Nigerian African collective culture, we tend to do a lot of things based on the social factors, based on the outsiders, based on satisfying the need of others, even satisfying our own need. And so in my experience, I figured out that most of the things we tend to do are externally driven. Nevertheless, over the time, we tend to integrate those things that we make them our own. That is why I am happy when somebody is happy because of what I did. But the goal is to make the other person happy, but I gain some reward or satisfaction when the other person is happy because of what I've done. And so these are part of the things that happen. So after sharing this experience, the professor was a little bit interested in that conversation that changed the narrative of the class. And from that day forward, he will always say, Aloy, how do you think about these uh, theoretical analysis or uh, motivational theories in relation to your collective culture? At some point, I, it, it was odd because I am always picked upon, but again, because I saw that as an opportunity to share my experience that would be for the goal of a greater majority out there. I didn't mind doing those things. And so you see that the idea I brought into the class because of the diversity of my culture and experience changed the narrative in the class and increased the understanding about how things are. Nevertheless, this doesn't happen all the time in most multicultural classroom contexts, which alludes to the challenges of multicultural classroom context. When you look at the picture on the upper right corner, you will notice something there. 
that can tell us something about issue of racism and social injustice, which a lot of students experience in their classes. That notwithstanding, you can also experience the issues of lack of intercultural communication, negotiating on familiar learning structures, just like my own experience in the first day of class, and the differences or mismatch between home and school cultures. And so you will notice that when students who are from cultural backgrounds that are represented in the same classes, they are quickly adapted to the environment, unlike international students or students from minority group whose culture are not represented in the class. And so that can be a challenge that would necessitate and will inhinge on their motivation and participation in the class. I remember one day during recreation, I was with some teacher candidates and they were having some interesting conversations. And so when I joined them as part of the conversations, they asked me whether I've read a particular novel. Honestly, I've not read it. I don't even know about the novel. And I told them, and they were surprised. They said, this is a common novel in Canada. And then I said to them, have you read Things Fall Apart? They're like, huh? I said, huh? Things Fall Apart. <laughs> I said, okay, have you read Arrow of God? They said, no, they've not. I said, okay. These are novels written by Nigerian prolific writer and novelist Chino Achebe, whose writings are common in Nigeria and even in West Africa. I asked them this question just to draw their attention to the fact that what is considered common in a place might not be common in another place. And this is part of the challenge we see in the teacher preparatory program that tend not to prepare the teachers with the necessary information, tools, experiences, and ideas that will help them be effective when it comes to supporting students' motivation and engagement in diverse classrooms. And when this happens, you notice that students are constrained in their motivation and engagement to learn. When we think about these challenges, one of the important questions we might begin to ask is, how can we solve this? What will be the way forward? And I think that one of the ways we can address the issues of cultural diversity is beginning to examine and understand the impact of context in learning. And so we learn in context. Learning happens in context and we can't understand the learning outside of the context it happens. When we look at the green section of the round picture you find there, or we can think about broader context, the larger context of the society, the culture where the learning is happening, those larger, broader context has influence on what is being taught in school and how they are taught. The curriculum of some subject areas are not the same in different countries, telling you how the broader context shape what is being taught in the school. And then there is this understanding, the findings from research that learners interact with these multiple layers of context and that shaped the way they learn, they are motivated to be in the class. And research shows that students tend to be motivated and engage in things they find relevant to their culture, to their lived experiences. And that has some backup with social cultural theory of learning, which emphasizes that learning has social cultural foundation. And so we learn in the context of our culture and society when we look at the impact of learning, or impact of culture on students' learning, that tells us the most critical thing we need to consider in our schools, and that is the impact of culture and how we could address the cultural diversities by paying attention to how we can learn from student culture in order to support their learning. There are many culturally inspired pedagogies that could be of help in this process because of the way they foreground the impact of culture on students' learning processes. We can think of culturally responsible
comprehensive teaching, which emphasizes on the need to use students' knowledge, their background, their experiences as resources for teaching them. We also come across a bioculturally relevant pedagogy that emphasizes on the need to raise students' critical consciousness to help them to begin to question some of the issues of injustice, racism in the society and even in school, and to support them in their academic excellence. And recently, there is a conversations around culturally sustaining pedagogies. And so this is about sustaining the students' cultural frame of mind, their languages, their literacies, in order to create a plural community that will lead to a social transformation. And researchers from these areas, although from different framework or perspectives, they have suggested some practices which teachers could use in the class in order to bring about some of these ideas. And they're always connected to students' motivation and engagement. For example, when we look at culturally responsive teaching, there are some examples of how teachers could design classroom activities, even assignment that would be relevant to students' culture in order to increase their motivation and engagement. This area of research has been challenged and been criticized for a few things. There is this understanding that attention is paid more on teachers, making it too difficult for them. So you ask some questions. If you're a teacher in a classroom where you have about 20 something students from different cultural backgrounds, how do you know their cultures in order to connect your class to them? And this is where what I did in my motivation class can be of help. You remember when I was able to connect class discussion about extrinsic motivation with my lived experiences, but not all students would have that courage to do that. And so I think that empowering students in such a way that they will be able to bring in those elements of their cultures, their lived experiences, might be part of the ways we could do this and achieve the purpose in classroom context. And this is what self-regulation of learning can help us to do. Self-regulated learning is a kind of learning process that pays attention in empowering students to take control of their thinking, their actions, in order to navigate environmental challenges and achieve um, some goals. And self-regulated learners are successful because they are proactive, they are strategic, they set goals, they persist even in challenging moments because they are motivated to achieve their goals. So they have control over their motivation and engagement. It is just recently that area in this research is paying attention to the impact of society, social and cultural context in learning. But what do we do with this? Where do we go from this? Based on the complementarity between these two areas of research, I, I thought that it might be good to have a deeper idea and conversations about how best to put them together. And so in 2017, I conducted a theoretical analysis based on social, cultural, and situated approach to learning to look at these two areas of research. And I noticed there is a synergy between the principles and practices of these two areas. For example, they both talk about the interaction between the learner and the context. There is emphasis on choice in both areas that when students are offered choices, they take control of their learning and are motivated to complete that. And so the outcome of this theoretical analysis is culturally responsive, self-regulated framework. This is a framework could be used to design for motivation and engagement in multicultural classroom context. This framework has three interconnected and interdependent components. The first one is classroom foundational practices. The second one is designed instructional practices. The third one is dynamic supportive practices. 
Let's look at each of them and see how they could be used in the classroom, especially to support student learning. Classroom foundational practices are those practices that teachers could use in order to get to know their students, who they are, where they're coming from, what are those rich experiences and cultural values they are bringing into the classroom context, and how can we, based on the diversity of the students, create enabling, welcoming, and safe environment where students are ready to take risks because they want to learn. One of the teachers I've worked in the past in this area, Ms. Venus, in order to understand her students, have them work on a project that asks them to ask questions to their parents, to people around them about their background, their cultures, and then also to think about what learning and education was in their original culture and share the same in the classroom. And through this process, there were opportunities for Venice to understand more about the students, to know their strengths and their weaknesses. When we get this understanding, it will help us in the second segment or the component of the framework designing instructional practices that integrate ideas from cultural responsive teaching and self-regulated learning. And one of the teachers, another person, Mr. Joseph, implemented this in his class when he designed a big project. And one aspect of the project asked the students to learn more about the indigenous people in Canada. And the students were asked to make a choice of all the, about the three outstanding um, sections of the, the, the indigenous people, the First Nations, Inuit and Métis. And so they conducted research of their interest in these areas. And they also went to the famous Museum of Anthropology at University of British Columbia. And they saw some of the artifacts of these people, especially the First Nations. And when they came back from there, the teacher asked them to think about what they've experienced, what they learned about this culture and how they could be connected or disconnected from their own personal culture. By doing this, Joseph was helping the students to bring in the elements of their culture while learning other people's culture. And there was an increase in cultural competence and the students were happy and the day I observed this particular class sharing their experiences, they blew my mind because you see the students with all enthusiasm sharing about their ideas, the experiences and things about themselves. And the third dimension of this framework is the dynamic supportive practices. These are practices that are available to students as their learning unfolds. And so you think about the practices of feedback, assessment, uh, self-assessment, teacher feedback, peer feedback. And parents can also be part of this multidimensional feedback process. The same Mr. Joseph in his class created a website where he shares students' work with their parents. And parents could see their student project even before they finish. And so they contribute to what the students are learning. And so by getting the parents involved in this support, they bridge the gap between home culture, home way of learning, and what is offered to the students in the classes. The teachers I've worked with have over time expressed the advantages and the benefits of this framework for them. One of the things they continually say is that the foundational practice have over the time helped them to understand their students the way they've never done before. And that is something to think about. And the findings I have already you know, appreciated in this research is that students engagement and motivation is in the highest level at the moments or the context or activities that has two things in common. That is when there are opportunities to make connection between class activities 
and student learning experiences, their lived experiences. In other words, those contexts that integrated ideas from cultural responsive teaching and self-regulatory learning. And something that seemed to be powerful in those contexts is the issue of choice. That when students have choices on what to work on in relation to their culture and how to demonstrate their learning, they were motivated and engaged to complete that task. What is this showing us? that this framework should be used, it could be used to design motivating and uh, engaging classroom context to support all learners, especially a multicultural classroom context. Let's pause for a moment and think. The image you see is the kind of classroom I imagine for our students, where they're happy, where they're excited, to learn together and support one another to achieve their dreams in life. What if the professor in that first day of class I attended had us introduce ourselves and even use icebreakers to get us into to talking into one another? I'm not sure I would have gone home without feeling of not belonging in that classroom as I did. Can we think about how students will be motivated to go to school if they notice that their teachers have vested interest in who they are and who they want to become? Some students have dropped out of school because they didn't find the relevance of what they were doing in school to their lives or even their communities. Can we think and begin to learn and know more about our students, the aspirations in life, the experiences, their interests, and build on this information to create opportunities through activities in the class like assignments that are relevant to them and even their communities. Can we imagine how motivating and engaging school will be for students to see and appreciate and know that their teachers have all sorts of supports for them, the support they need in order to be effective and achieve their goals in life. These thoughts can lead us to appreciate the need to begin now to reimagine our schools, our classrooms, to pay attention to student cultures, and to see how we can design motivating and uh, engaging environment just like I shared in order to prepare our students to become global citizens who would work harmoniously to make a difference in our 21st century multicultural society. Thank you for your audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Anichi. That was such a wonderful presentation. And um, I'm just going to open the floor now. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. You can also use the chat. I'll be monitoring that as well. Okay. I can oh, go ahead, Natasha Lee. So great presentation, um, Dr. Anichi. Um, very well done. I really made some connections to my own research and what I am wanting to do at the doctoral level. So in terms of um, school discipline and just on the, with the background of um, disproportionality for students of color, black students um, in terms of the administration of discipline practices. So I am wondering from your own work in terms of culturally responsive teaching. Um, is there any connection specifically to the learning context that you showed in terms of that circle where discipline could fit um, in this sense of culturally responsive discipline practices? Thank you, Natasha. I think that's um, a great um, question. 
Um, there are so many ways I think we can imagine those discipline. Um, the classroom foundational practice can play a role in the sense that understanding how different cultures discipline their kids might be helpful. And so connecting with the families as part of the foundational practices to understand how do students or kids in your context are disciplined. And so to bring that element into the class and then the supportive uh, dynamic supportive practice can also be a way to look at it where parents are involved in student learning. And so when you think about discipline, the student, the parents can also be involved in that disciplinary measures by sharing ideas on how you can discipline the student that is a little bit related to their own culture or to transfer that disciplinary measures to them to carry it out. I don't know if that helps in any ways, Natalia. Yes, it does. Um, thank you. Because um, in terms of my work and what I have been trying to come up with, I've been looking at context and I can recall um, probably um, late last year um, where a student here in Manitoba was um, disciplined um, for not standing for O Canada. And I believe that that shows um, that in terms of discipline, there's some gap where um, a teacher should be culturally responsive in understanding why an indigenous student would not want to stand for O Canada. And so I was just thinking along those lines in terms of how is it, how is it that um, as educators, we can be more um, prepared in terms of responding to um, what we will deem um, inappropriate behavior. And I'm thinking that going back to the cultural context uh, may be important in that regard. Yeah, I agree with you. It's always important to find out from the students the rationale behind their actions and how those actions may have been shaped by their social and cultural context and experiences. Thanks for that great first question, Natasha Lee. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to bring forward? Uh, hi. Hi, please go ahead. So uh, my question would be, um, what would be your advice or recommendation for teachers that do not um, carry into uh, foreign students along with them because as an international student here in the United States I think I've shared that experience with you um, you may ask a certain question and he's, they'll say it's your responsibility to understand maybe English or something else before you ask questions so sometimes you feel like you're withdrawn being in class but you really want to be in class so how would you advise the teacher to be mindful of all the students that are not from, you know, same culture with them. Thank you, Ifanaya, for that question. I think uh, one of the things I will suggest is that as teachers, we start with looking at our own cultural bias, to think about where we're coming from, and how we might be biased about some other students uh, from different cultures and how that might be impacting the way we teach them. But at the same time, when we remember that students are in the class to learn, like I talk about the dynamic supportive practices, the idea will be to think about how best can I support a particular student. When a student asks a question, that means the student doesn't know that and would want to learn. It is advisable for the teacher to come up with ideas on how to suggest uh, to the students to move forward. So if it is issue of English, the student could be referred to some of the support services at the university or even be helped in different ways that will help them to learn that ideas. There should be, if possible, uh, learning bodies for the students 
so that they have someone who is local that can carry them along in situations like that. So obviously, one of my major recommendations will be the teachers to begin to think about how they might be biased against other students or other cultures and how that is shaping how they teach. And then for them to be there to support the students in order to learn and be motivated to be in class the next day. Uh, does that help? Uh, so oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. What? I see one question in the chat that I'll just read to you, Eloy. It says, thank you, doctor, for this presentation. I can relate to your experiences as a first time international student. How do we get professors to adapt to practicing this? Good and interesting question. I think what we are doing now might be part of the process. Uh, making it available to them and having conversations uh, within the faculty members about the need to attend to these issues. Uh, I had a conversation in the past, a podcast, and uh, in that podcast, a professor there became interested in what I shared and wanted to learn more. And she invited me to her class where we had conversations about this. And so that is one of the ways professors or faculty members can get into doing this by thinking about how they can apply this. I'm open to have conversations on how they can apply this in their own classes. Some other things might be during conferences, they might get to hear more about this, but obviously I think it's a question of choice. So if someone knows that he or she is not knowledgeable on how to support diverse students, to make that choice, to go outside of the individual's comfort zone in order to find out the support that is needed in order to carry every student along. So I think that might be some of the ways that we can get um, the professors or teachers into doing some of these things. And I think that is a, a very interesting question. There's one more question in the chat for you. It says, thank you, Dr. Anichi, for this. I'm wondering if you think this framework can be applied in corporate environment for teams with diverse members. 100%. It can apply. So let's go through the whole cycle of the framework and just in a bit how that could apply in corporate uh, institutions. You know, in workforce today, we have this diversity of people working in the same company from different cultural background experiences and even aspirations. So when we think about the foundational practice that is about knowing the students, this now becomes knowing the workers. So in an office, the manager or the director, knowing who are the people working on his team or her team knowing their cultural backgrounds, knowing their interests, knowing what they want, what the thing that is the most important thing for them to work on. And so when these are known, the workplace could be designed in such a way that people are allowed to achieve the goal of the company in a way that suits best for them. So instead of micromanaging people, you can just give them a task and then allow them to carry out the tags the way that works for them and then give you the result. However, you can touch on them from time to time to see if that is working or not. And then the support will be, if you have a, a, a worker from maybe a different country, new in the environment, to help the person adapt to the culture of the working place instead of just saying that this person is not performing or complaining about the individual, to find out the kind of support the individual needs in that office. It might be that the person doesn't know how to negotiate things because it's not possible where the individual is coming from or different. 
But when the manager or the supervisor knows that someone who is from another culture might have some challenges, might be able to have conversation with the individual to ask, what kind of support do you need in this workplace in order to help you move forward, in order to help you be better than the way you came into this company? Such conversations can emerge with possible supports. And so you see that the whole framework could be perfectly situated in the context of a team within a corporate body. Thank you. There's another question for you up in the chat. This is great. I'm loving these questions, everyone. Uh, this one says, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Anichi. I'm wondering if you have any books you would recommend for teachers to read. There are multiple books. Uh, let me check in my shelf here. I can think of uh, there are many of them, depending on how you want to read. And so I have uh, some of the books here, The Dream Keepers from Gloria Latsin Billing. This is a wonderful book on culturally relevant pedagogy. And I have also here Cultural Responsive Teaching by Geneva Gay. She has a lot of practical practices that could be done to support students. And there are other multiple um, works I can pull from my shelf. Um, it depends on how you read. Some of them might be too dense, but these ones have practical practices that could be used to support students in the class. So you can also Google uh, works of um, Geneva Gay, Lassen Balance. These are classical works. Uh, they've written some articles that have uh, some practices that could be done in the class. And also my dissertation has a lot of practical examples, which you could also apply in your context. So in my dissertation, I have uh, examples of what teachers have done and how those were able to be effective um, in their classes. So this might be a possible basic of recommendation for you to start with. And when you are done with those and you're not satisfied, you can shoot me an email. I can recommend some other work for you. That's great, thank you. I have one more question here for you. Um, in light of the disconnect between what some students experience in their home, in their home culture or in their home, in, new home in Canada, um, compared to what students experience in school. So I'm, I'm thinking of a particular story that I heard from someone that I know who said that when he was a, an immigrant child growing up in Canada at home, the lessons were don't talk back to your teacher, don't say anything in class. And then the lessons in school were speak up for yourself, be independent. And it felt like two very different worlds, which you're familiar with, I'm sure. And so in light of that disconnect, where do you think it's most effective for advocates or allies to focus their efforts, working with teachers to become more culturally responsive, working with pre-service teachers, working in advocacy to work for more hiring of diverse teachers, working with students, parents, you know, you've mentioned many things, but do you have ideas about what would be, um, maybe it's all of the above, a thousand pushes in the right direction. What are your thoughts about that? This is very um, huge and uh, important question. And I, I think you touched upon almost all the things I would say, because as I mentioned, we learn in contexts and uh, multiple layers of context shape what happens. And so when it comes to addressing the issues of cultural diversity, I think we have to approach it from all multiple layers of context, even from the political point of view to the what happened in the class and all the stakeholders. Because if a particular class, for example, is trying to be culturally responsive, but the authority in that school is against it, that wouldn't work. So the teacher could be fired for maybe doing what they consider not the uh, right thing to do. And for me, every, all hands should be on deck with regards to making sure that attention is paid on culture, the impact of fit on learning, and how to support the individual child 
regardless of the culture they are coming from. So my take on that would be that all these approaches you have mentioned and all the quarters could be involved in the whole conversation. And I will say that based on my experiences and also my lived experiences at home, because in my culture, the idea is it takes a village to raise a child. And so you take all that are involved in the education process to write and rewrite the story to support students. Thank you so much. I have one more question for you here. Um, how can teachers begin to engage students from different cultures in order for them to share and for students to learn from one another without reducing cultures to stereotypes or um, you know the three d's of dress dialect and dance how can they do that in a way that's um, more authentic and engaging maybe another interesting question um just to say at the upfront that in as much as we talk about cultures we will also remember there is individual differences. And so even within the same culture, there are individual differences with regards to some of the expressions. And what I would recommend and say is that, let's not look at it from the perspective of this other student's culture or the immigrants or no. Like I mentioned, every student have a, has a culture that they bring into the class. And so what we want to learn from each other is just to find out from all the students, their lived experiences. So for example, in some of my classes, when I teach a topic or a concept, I will throw it up in for people to think about this idea and how it relates to them. And so by sharing those ideas from different backgrounds and lived experiences, we are enriching that conversation. And so by doing that, we are not exactly saying that for the fact that a student from maybe Rwanda shared an experience, and that is the experience of all the Rwandans, no. So that is something we may have to be very careful about. But the main thing is to allow students to share the experiences and see how that experiences could be used to support their learning in the class. Thank you. I'll just leave it open for a few more minutes if anyone has yeah. a final question. I've got a question here, Michelle. Great, go ahead, Davian. Okay, thank you. Uh, very good presentation, uh, Dr. Alloy. Um, I just had one thought about, um, if you came across this in your research, in terms of, students who felt the need to subdue their cultural background or experiences because of uh, power differentials in the classroom and how might your uh, responsive self-regulated learn learning framework support those students who feel that you know they have to subdue their culture they can't let themselves shine through and how does that impact performance or behavior in the classroom um, let me be sure I understand your question very well. So you're talking about students who probably because they are the minority group in a cultural setting in a class, not being able to express themselves the way they ordinarily would want to. Is that part of the question? Yes, that is exactly what I'm asking. Okay. Uh, I think I personally has um, a similar experiences sometimes, but what my friend work would do and has helped me over the time is that idea of empowerment that students could take ownership of their learning. And part of taking the ownership of their learning is to share their views. However, because different students from different cultural backgrounds have uh, different approaches to learning, that is where it's very important that teachers will create such a safe environment so that such students who would ordinarily not willing to share will be happy to share because they see the class as a community of learners where everybody's learning, nobody knows it all. I think part of the challenge is that in some classes, 
such students feel a little bit put at the back burner because there isn't no attention to them. There is no um, safe environment created in the class. And so they don't feel comfortable to share ideas. And so when teachers begin to make the class comfortable such so that the class could be as a place where people will share their opinions without being judged because of who they are, that will create such opportunities for those students to uh, come up with their ideas. And that is what self-regulation can do for them. For example, I mentioned that choice is very important when it comes to self-regulation. And so even if they don't share verbally in the class, they could be given choices on topic to write. And by writing, they can bring in those elements they are not comfortable to share openly verbally in their writing. And so that way they're expressing themselves. I don't know if that helped the view. No, that, that, that helps me quite a lot, um, Dr. Aloysius. And as an international student who came a few years ago, I too had some of those experiences. And I think it was not until I began to write and express how I was feeling, then I was noticed that, hey, here's a learner who has some extensive knowledge and experiences. And given the opportunity to share, I think the classroom could be better. And I think it has grown from then and to the point where I did feel comfortable opening up and sharing and it did make learning much, much more interesting. So thanks for, for sharing that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Still have a few more minutes. If there are any final questions, please go ahead. Great. Well, if not, you can always send either myself or Dr. Anichi an email or something like that afterwards. We welcome that. And I want to just thank you again so much for coming to this Doc Talk series for spreading ideas and knowledge and sparking innovation and creativ creativity. And so thank you again to Dr. Anichi for sharing your framework with us and for encouraging us all to uh, think about these issues and giving us some practical ways that we can move forward. Um, I think that's all from me. And so thank you again to everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Lam, for having me. Yes, there are some nice comments in the chat as well. Thanking you, Dr. Anichi. And thanks, everybody, for sparing your time to be part of these conversations including the very important and uh, thought-provoking questions. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I will be sending out this recording afterwards. If you'd like to see it, um, probably in the next day or two, you'll receive it. So you should be getting an email from me in a couple of days. Thanks again, everyone.